name is Ethan Harper. I am the president of the Harvard chapter of the Federal Society, which is a distinct privilege uh, to talk about privileges or immunities today. It does not come with any immunities, though, unfortunately. Maybe a few liabilities. Uh, but that's not good. I also have the distinct privilege of recognizing the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs in our first event back. In our first event back after the Super Bowl. So we would like to thank. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. That's <laughs> okay. They're, they're holding on for dear life like so. Like some Eagles defenders. Um, thank you for coming today. I'm going to throw it over to what well, first the uh, Federal Society stands for three main principles. First, that the state is to preserve freedom. Second, that the separation of powers is central to our Constitution. And third, that is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to see if the law is not what it should be. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to our Vice President and Speaker, Ben Ponce, to introduce today's event. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for being here. We're delighted to be hosting this conversation on the state of the research on the Privileges for Immunities Clause. I also want to thank the National Federalist Society's Practice Group on Property Rights and Environmental Law, which is our putative co-sponsor for today. Um, today, we have three uh, visitors with us, uh, all of whom have very strong ties to Stanford University, and I, I really tried hard to come up with some good Stanford jokes, but I couldn't. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them as if there are no jokes about Stanford to be made. But in any case, uh, first we have Professor Lawrence Lessig, who taught uh, at Stanford uh, University, but he went to the University of Pennsylvania in God's chosen state. Um, we're going to Yale Law School, and in between uh, went to Cambridge and, and got a master's degree here. He taught at Stanford Law School and has now been teaching here, uh, where among other classes he teaches readings in Reconstruction, which I know is a popular class among many in this room. Um, and, and so he's been doing a lot of work on this issue, and we're really thrilled to have him today. Next to Professor Lessig, we have Professor Fred Campbell, who's joining us this semester at Harvard Law School from Richmond University Law School. Professor Campbell uh, is a graduate of UNC and then Stanford Law School, uh, and, and he's here this year teaching First Amendment as well as a reading group on Congress, and he has a coming paper on this subject. Uh, with Professor Sachs, who was supposed to be with us today, but at the last moment was unable to join us, he sends his best. Um, and then finally, joining us from Arizona State University at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law, we have Professor Elon Morgan, uh, who is another graduate of Stanford Law School. He went to Claremont McKenna College uh, and, and has been teaching at Arizona State. I believe recently got tenure, so congratulations. Approved for tenure, so I can't quite say anything. Was crazy. approved for tenure, terrific. <laughs> um, and then finally, our moderator today uh, is my friend Tom Koenig. Uh, <laughs> wasn't able to join us, it occurred to me that there were really two options to moderate this event, Tom Koenig or ChatGPT. Um, and I did actually consult with ChatGPT for about a half an hour on this subject, and it was able to ask some questions that were mildly relevant, um, but given that Tom is, you know, a sentient human being, I thought he probably edged out ChatGPT a little bit. Tom is a graduate of Princeton University, a 2L ETFs for Professor Lessing's seminar, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to him before he starts hurling fruit at me. So, uh, Thanks. Thank you, Ben, for the ringing endorsement as a sentient human being. Um, but also thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Uh, I'm just going to start the conversation by reading Section 1 and Section 5 of the 14th Amendment just to situate ourselves. And then I think we're going to go Professor Werman, Professor Campbell, Professor Lessig, and we'll go from there. So here's Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And here's section five. The Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So with that level setting, I'll turn it over to Professor Werman for our initial set of remarks. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, Professor Campbell and I were classmates at Stanford, too. We overlapped for a bit, so I'm particularly pleased to be sharing the stage with him. And Professor Lessig doesn't know this, but when I was a prospective student, I, the one class that I attended uh, was his class at Stanford. I'm not going to say that he was one of the reasons that got me to the role at Stanford, since he promptly disappeared 
grossly out of the moment, but I thoroughly remember and I enjoyed the, uh, the class's presentation, so I'm also very glad to be sharing with students there. Okay, well, I'm here because I have a paper as well, uh, and a book on this topic, by the way. Uh, I brought the book in case uh, anyone wants to see it after. Sorry. <laughs> I have a seven-week-old at home, so I'm a bit sleep deprived. Um, so sorry about that. But I mostly want to talk to you about the paper. The paper is provocatively called Reversing Incorporation. Yes, that's a play on reverse incorporation. The paper examines all the leading scholarship on the question of whether the 14th Amendment was intended to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states. And it comes up with a somewhat uh, contrarian conclusion. And to back up, the paper is something of a long footnote to this book that I tried to show you before it slipped my hand, the second founding and introduction of the 14th Amendment, which I spoke about here at Harvard a few years ago, for those of you who are, I guess, three hours might have been there. So in the book, I argue that the Privileges or Immunities Clause, where no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, this clause was, at a minimum, the 14th Amendment's equality guarantee. We know the amendment was intended to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which required equality in contract and property rights and the like. And we also know that the Equal Protection Clause doesn't do the trick, because protection of the laws was a narrow legal concept related to legal remedies and protection against private violence and private invasion of private rights. So that leaves only the Privileges or Immunities Clause to do the necessary work of constitutionalizing the Civil Rights Act. And what's more, the language does the work. The framers in the 39th Congress routinely refer to contract rights, property rights, and the like, which were in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, as among the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. These were the rights that all free governments had to secure. That did not mean, however, that the states regulated these rights in the same way. So each state could and did have a different law of contract or of property. But contract and property rights were still rights of national citizenship. A state abridges such rights only if it regulates them one way for one class of citizens and differently for another. Still, the word abridge could easily mean to reduce from a baseline, so it's possible that the clause is both an equality guarantee and a fundamental rights guarantee. Although my book argued for the equality reading, if you remember my talk from a few years ago, the book didn't totally discount the possibility that it also does some fundamental rights work, you know, or incorporation work, uh, but it expressed skepticism. Well, this paper, which was 145 pages, now it's just 88 pages, so an easy read. This paper does the heavy lifting on that question. It sifts through all the leading scholarship and concludes that the conventional wisdom about incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states is seriously overstated, if not outright mistaken. So what I found is that there's a pervasive conceptual error in the literature. Most incorporationist scholars conflate any reference to the rights in the Bill of Rights with the Bill of Rights itself. In other words, any time the right to bear arms or the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press is mentioned in Congress or among abolitionists, it's taken as evidence that the speaker wants to nationalize these rights, something on the order of making the First or Second Amendment applicable against the states. This is a serious error, as I hope to show with a few examples it was widely understood that these rights were antecedent to the First Eight Amendments. Merely identifying such rights as fundamental does not tell us anything about how various constitutional provisions secure them. The First Eight Amendments secure these rights in their way, but Article IV's Comity Clause, the Republican Guarantee Clause, the Privileges or Immunities Clause also secure them, but not necessarily in the same way. And I'll come back to that. Okay, first though, here are four quick examples of conflation in the literature. First, and I'm going to pick on these two because they sort of led the charge with this incorporationist literature. Both Michael Kent Curtis and Akeem Lamar cite a pamphlet from Senator Plumer written in response to a committee report by John C. Calhoun that had argued that the northern states were obligated to prohibit abolitionist literature. Okay, this is, I mean, this is a crazy position. Uh, they cite the claim, Amar and Curtis cite uh, this uh, uh, pamphlet for the proposition 
Quote, the panel asserted that First Amendment rights of speech and press were protected against both federal and state interference. That's from Curtis and Mars. It's almost identical to that. Uh, and you know, he relies on Curtis, too. The strong implication from their work is that Plumer believed that the First Amendment already bound the states, or that it ought to, that he was a very contrarian in the Antebellum period. But if you read the pamphlet, Plumer goes through every single state constitution that existed and quotes the state's First Amendment equivalent. He therefore concludes from these provisions that neither the United States nor any state may abridge the freedom of speech if these state constitutional provisions mean the same thing as the federal First Amendment does. And not because the Bill of Rights applied or should apply, but because the states already protected these rights in their own constitutions. Okay, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. What are some other ones? It was routinely declared that no state may rightfully deny or abridge the freedom of speech or of the press or the rights of their arms. But if you read these statements, the speakers were saying that no state may rightfully abridge these rights because no free government could do so as a matter of first principles. That is very different from saying that the Second Amendment's specific terms apply to the states. Similarly, time and again, speakers asserted that slavery required the suppression of civil liberties, like the rights of speech and press. But they also assumed that when slavery was abolished, these rights would naturally be restored at the state level. Yet every time such propositions are stated in historical materials, Amar, Curtis, and other scholars suggest that that militates in favor of incorporation, merely because it mentions the freedom of speech or the freedom of the person. Third, scholars have relied heavily on statements made by Republicans during the debates over readmission of the seceded states. Curtis, for example, claims that members didn't want states admitted until they respected the first, second, fourth, and fifth amendments. That's a paraphrase from his book. But this has nothing to do with incorporation. These speakers all relied on the Republican Guarantee Clause. They argued that the southern states did not have Republican governments, and that the Constitution itself <laughs> described or illustrated what a Republican government would look like, including through its protections of various rights. Until the states, therefore, protected similar rights, and therefore were Republican form, they shouldn't be admitted. That was the argument. That again tells us nothing about incorporation. Okay, my fourth example is the most provocative. The speech of Senator Jacob Howard when he introduced the amendment in the Senate. This speech is universally believed to be evidence for incorporation. Even Charles Fairman, I mean, maybe you don't know who that is, but even Charles Fairman thought it was the strongest evidence against him. But I'm not so sure. It is widely believed that Howard described the first eight amendments as being among the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. What he actually says, however, is that the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens are the same as the privileges and immunities of Article 4's Comedy Clause. Article 4, Section 2, by the way, why is it called the Comedy Clause today? It required equality in these rights by requiring each equal treatment of out-of-state citizens. Anyway, Howard describes these rights that Article 4 secured, including property and contract rights, if you remember Corfield v. Correa. And then he says, to these privileges and immunities should be added the personal rights guaranteed and secured by the First Eight Amendments of the Constitution. He doesn't say the First Eight Amendments, but he says the personal rights secured by those amendments. That the First Eight Amendments happen to refer to and secure in their way. Howard, in other words, was using the First Eight Amendments as illustrations of what the privileges and immunities of US citizens are, namely the fundamental rights that all free governments have to secure. He didn't say anything in that passage about how the new privileges or immunities clause would secure them. He's merely identified as among the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens. All he says on this second point is more or less that the great object of Section 1 is to restrain the power of the states and compel them at all times to respect these great fundamental guarantees. Now, I kind of read that quickly. Howard's statement can certainly be interpreted to mean that he thought the clause would apply all eight amendments against the states. But that reading is not compelled. The Privileges or Immunities Clause could ensure this respect either by prohibiting discrimination in these natural and personal rights against a disfavored class of citizens, like Article 4 does, or by prohibiting any infringement outright, as the First Eight Amendments do. Either is possible. Indeed, here is how an 1871 treatise treated Article 4. The author explained that the Privileges and Immunities covered by Article 4 were the privileges and immunities of national citizens, of citizens of the United States, including the rights, quote, specified and enumerated in the federal constitution. 
But the clause itself only required a state to treat out-of-state citizens equally with respect to such rights. The states without Article 4, the treatise said, by their local legislation, might and perhaps would impose different restrictions on the residents of each other, militating against those unalienable rights. So here's a wonderful illustration of how a clause that secured equality in fundamental rights was talked about as though it secured the fundamental rights of US citizens. Here's another illustration. Lyman Trumbull defended the Civil Rights Act, again, which was an equality guarantee. Right? It said whatever civil rights contract property white citizens have, citizens of any color without, should, should have those rights too. Here's how Trumbull defended it. Each state, so that it does not abridge, each state, so it does not abridge the great fundamental rights belonging under the Constitution to all citizens, may grant or withhold such civil rights as it pleases. All that is required is that in this respect, its laws shall be impartial. Here then are two illustrations that really identifying the privileges and immunities of citizenship doesn't tell us about how any particular provision secure them. Fundamental rights can be guaranteed by guaranteeing equality. And in fact, the two key precursors to, our, to the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause, Article 4's Privileges and Immunities Clause in the Civil Rights Bill, both secure fundamental rights by securing equality. So to summarize, I'm near, nearing the end, it was perfectly, cons I, I don't think, it was perfectly consistent to believe, I just see you <laughs> to believe that there were fundamental rights that all free governments had to secure, including the kinds of rights secured by the First State Amendment, that the states could nevertheless regulate those rights in different ways, but that the federal government could step in if and when the states discriminated in the provision of these fundamental rights, or as Trumbull said, if and when the states abridged these rights. Okay, so let me conclude by supposing that I'm wrong. It's happened before. I feel like every six months I walk back a previous lecture, or whatever. Okay. So it's <laughs> But not this one, I'm pretty sure this one's right. <laughs> but supposing that I'm wrong, okay, and the clause is an absolute guarantee of some kind, even if that's true, that would still look nothing like incorporation. The privileges and immunities of citizens, or those rights that all free governments have to secure, the Reconstruction generation said that over and over again. What does that mean? Perhaps a state can't prohibit political speech or suppress newspapers. But does that mean no state can prohibit flattery? The sale of violent video games to minors? Animal crush videos? Protesting at a dead soldier's funeral? Stealing valor? The Supreme Court has applied a uniform answer to these questions in all 50 states through the incorporation of the First Amendment. <coughs> but must all free governments have the same answers to such questions? That question, I think, answers itself. Thank you. Don't believe anything you hear about the general law, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, <laughs> that was unfair, I take it back. Let's um, jump in. We've got uh, a couple key concepts to get on the table. Some of those concepts relate to things that Alon was talking about. Uh, and so there's actually gonna be a fair amount of overlap um, the idea of general fundamental rights that he's embracing uh, in his talk is grounded in general law. So um, let's, uh, let's just jump in. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the idea of general citizenship rights, which I think is closely related to what um, uh, Ilan's uh, concept was of general fundamental rights to which the Constitution refers. I'm then gonna talk a little bit about the idea of general citizenship. Uh, and the way in which that concept relates to Article 4, and then bring it to the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So general citizenship rights are basic fundamental rights, rights that used to be thought of as rights of Englishmen. These are rights that are grounded in the idea of a social contract that predates a constitution. This is an older way of thinking, that you don't get your rights from the constitution, but instead that your rights are recognized in a social contract prior to the formation of a government through the Constitution. This is absolutely central to the way that people at the founding through the 19th century are thinking about fundamental rights. This includes the idea of retained natural rights. These are often summarized as life, liberty, or property, things you can do in a state of nature and that you retain upon entering a state of civil society. It also includes fundamental common law rights. These are basic axioms 
uh, of English governance, things like the right to confront witnesses, the right to trial by jury, the right against prior restraints, and so on. Um, and importantly, as Ilan was mentioning, states are able to regulate these rights. There's tons and tons of state law limiting your liberty, but states cannot abridge those rights, which is to say states are only allowed to regulate in promotion of the common good, but they're not allowed to restrain arbitrarily or corruptly. Uh, and they also cannot regulate in ways that take away whatever the customary uh, common law rights are that are deemed fundamental. Um, we see exactly this view in the Corfield case. That is that there are such rights that are fundamental, that are common to all free governments. Those rights include uh, fundamental common law rights like habeas, but they also include retained natural rights subject to regulation uh, in promotion of the common good. So this is um, exactly the idea of fundamental rights that uh, Washington is talking about in Corfield. Um, these uh, rights have a couple different characters that are uh, worth identifying because they differ from the way we tend to think about fundamental rights. One is that these rights quintessentially, paradigmatically operate against private interference. That's what uh, the interference would have been in a state of nature. And so um, these in, uh, are not subject to the sort of state action requirement that we would typically think about today. Um, a primary purpose of government is to protect and enforce and regulate these rights. So um, importantly, these rights are not operating in the way we tend to think about rights now, at least constitutional rights, as trump cards against legislative regulation. Really central because uh, when we think about what the purpose of the 14th Amendment was, as conceptualized by the framers of the 14th Amendment, they reiterate over and over and over again, we are not taking away state regulatory power. Um, and this helps us uh, account for why that would be. Um, here's uh, where the ghost, of, not ghost, he's not dead yet, but of Steve Sachs would enter. <laughs> um, general citizenship rights are grounded in general law. Uh, so these are rights that are common across state lines, and so they're not rights that are defined by uh, any particular uh, state law as understood um, in a sort of abstract sense. I wanna get a little more specific in a moment. Um, but prior to 19, uh, excuse me, 1868, these rights are not federally enforceable through the normal mechanisms of federal enforcement like Section 25 of the Judiciary Act. So because they are general law rights, not federal law rights, they're not rights that you can vindicate through an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, and that's essentially the holding of the Barron case. State regulations of those rights then are supplied by local law. So um, within a state, you have state citizenship rights that include these general fundamental rights. The federal constitution, this is the point that Alon was making, which I agree with, secures those rights against federal interference through amendments one through eight, those are the explicit protections, and amendment nine, the residual protection for other rights that are not enumerated. And then article four provides reciprocal protection of those rights across state lines through a concept called general citizenship. And so, um, at this point, it's helpful to just understand what this idea of general citizenship is because it forms a really important conceptual uh, backdrop to the debates over the 14th Amendment. So state citizenship just means that you're like a co-equal shareholder of a state polity. So you have the individual citizens of an individual state and they are state citizens. And national citizenship is the exact same idea but on a national level. So there's a body politic and you're just a member of the body politic. General citizenship is a little different. So general citizenship is the idea that the states have reciprocally agreed with each other to respect the general citizenship rights of the citizens of other states. So this is like a treaty, a quasi treaty sort of agreement. So it's an idea that there um, is a type of citizenship that's different from uh, citizenship in the social contractarian sense. And this is really um, central to the way that the framers are thinking about the function of Article 4. 
both under the Articles and under the Article 4 of um, the Constitution. That is that you have these general citizenship rights grounded in a state social contract but then, so those are state citizenship rights in some sense, but then they're also reciprocally recognized across state lines, which makes them general citizenship rights. So these rights are both state citizenship rights and general citizenship rights. Um, and uh, one of the things that's important to recognize about this in relation to Article 4 is that the purpose of Article 4 and the basic function of Article 4 is different than Articles 1 and 2. Articles 1 and 2 recognize a national constitution on behalf of a national body politic, and Article 4 functions more like a compact among states. This is central not only to the way John Calhoun is thinking about it, but also how Sam and Chase is thinking about it. Uh, that is, that Article 4 is a sort of quasi-treaty, uh, unlike Articles 1 and 2. Um, and so we see then that these ideas of citizenship are tracking different parts of the Constitution uh, in kind of interesting ways. The other thing, um, and this is where the backdrop to the 14th Amendment becomes especially important, is that the idea of US citizenship then is both a reference to, or the term US citizenship is both a reference to national citizenship and a reference to general citizenship. So the United States under this older conception is both a nation and a collection of states. A nation in Articles 1 and 2 and a collection of our, uh, states in Article 4. And so we see this, for instance, uh, in Philip Bliss's comment that the phrase, phrase citizen of the United States is not only employed to mean a person entitled all the privileges of citizens in the several states, sometimes called a general citizen. This is the Article 4 concept, but also to designate one as primarily a citizen of the Union as a single consolidated government. So what is the Privilege or Immunities Clause doing? Uh, on my view, what it is doing, it is, is protecting, it is securing a set of rights that already exist, that states are already responsible as a matter of the state's own social contract to protect and secure, but it's providing a mode of federal enforcement that was previously lacking. <laughs> So the 14th Amendment is not creating rights, it's not taking away the state's authority to regulate those rights, but it's recognizing that sometimes states might uh, regulate in ways that are count as abridgments, and now what we're gonna authorize is federal institutions to step in and recognize the invalidity of those laws that are not valid regulations, but instead invalid abridgments. One of the really important aspects of thinking in this way is that because the earlier law supplied these privileges or immunities and all the 14th Amendment is doing is providing a forum for adjudicating claims that otherwise would not have been federally adjudicable, the 14th Amendment doesn't actually answer some of the most difficult questions that we would wanna uh, address. So for instance, it doesn't tell us the 14th Amendment itself doesn't tell us exactly what the privileges or immunities of citizenship are. It doesn't tell us what counts as an abridgment, and uh, the Section 1 doesn't tell us, of course, what the scope of federal enforcement authority is. And therefore, when we're thinking about how to uh, conceptualize what it is the 14th Amendment is doing and what its quote unquote original meaning is, we actually can't and shouldn't focus on just the 14th Amendment. We need to think about its operation in relation to a whole set of background legal principles that people at the time thought were fundamental, but that existed in a sense apart from the 14th Amendment itself. Thanks so much. Great. Okay, so I'm incredibly happy to be able to follow um, uh, Judd's comments and tie them uh, together with Ilan's um, to make a point that I find this debate seems oblivious to. Um, and so here's, here's first of all, um, an introduction to that point. Um, we should also have Nico Bowie here. And if Nico were here, 
Nico would tell us something interesting about the phrase privileges and or privileges or immunities, or at least something interesting about how those clauses were understood at the time, the antebellum period of America. And what he would say is how they were understood was that the authority that had the power to determine, that's an important word here, to determine the substance under those clauses was both the courts and the legislatures. Both the courts and the legislatures. Okay, now that might be taken to mean that if we scan forward to 2023, the legislature under this idea should have the power to just declare a privilege or immunity. Because we can if the legislature has the power to determine it, let's determine it like that. But what that move fails to take seriously or listen seriously to is what Judd was just talking about. And that is that when that practice developed, there is a well-developed legal culture that understands how to determine rights through a process of reasoning that, um, uh, that Judd calls general law, that the paper refers to as general law reasoning. I'm gonna call it general law lawmaking. Um, and uh, Elon just tried to ridicule, but it's not ridiculous. It is serious. It is actually a capacity they had and it's an extraordinarily impressive capacity. It's an ability to do something which takes training and experience and it takes a certain kind of legal culture and it was forced upon them, we should not forget, by the necessity of finding a reason why we were allowed to separate from Britain. The birth of this whole way of thinking was the need to justify separating from Britain, and that led to the whole social compact theory reasoning methodology, which then entailed all sorts of fundamental rights, which we uh, take as, quote, self-evident, and those self-evident truths then guide us going forward. Okay, if that's the background, here's the point I wanna make, and I wanna use a prop to make this point. <laughs> so imagine, uh, a kind of, you know, last of us like scenario <clears throat> where, you know, there's a bunch of zombie like creatures out there infected with some fungus and we're trying to navigate our way around to avoid them. And this is not fair to the show because, of course, they don't have any technology in the show. But imagine the tech, there is a technology in the show like this, a phone. And we can pick up the phone and we can ask, should we go north or should we go south or east or west? And the answer will come, go north or south or east or west. And we do that, and anybody can do that, and they are avoiding these animals uh, or creatures, whatever they are, um, quite effectively. And then, at a certain point in the story, people see that the cord is not connected to anything. <laughs> and then the question is, what do you do? Do you continue to ask the phone? Should we go north, south, east, or west? Or should you just admit, hey, the phone doesn't have anything to say to us anymore. We're gonna have to work it out on our own. Okay, now the reason I want that analogy to be central to what I'm saying is, I think we need to recognize that's exactly what happened to general law in our tradition. There was a period of time where any competent lawyer could engage in that kind of conversation and believe that they were speaking to truth, like what follows, what's entailed. Oh, I know, I'm told, go north. And then at a later period of time, that talk was crazy talk. As Brandeis put it in Erie, law in the way in which courts speak of it today is not trying to figure out the deductive fundamental principles of general law. We lost the capacity to do that. And once you lose the capacity to do that, the really hard question is, what do you do? How do you go forward? Now what's striking about, I, Judd's not really an originalist, but he's writing with originalists, so he gets to be painted with them right now. But <laughs> So what's striking about the originalists, and even uh, uh, Adrian, both Adrian and the originalists, write in a way that kind of ignores this fundamental change. 
What's striking about Adrian's brilliant book is the word Erie v. Tompkins does not appear in the book. He acts as if we can engage in this project of um, you know, common, uh, uh, classic, this classical legal project in the same way today as they did in 1840 as if we had that capacity, as if you were trained as law students to be able to do that, but you're not. You couldn't do what they did back then. You wouldn't be able to. You'd be sitting there with your realist skepticism at every single assertion of what was entailed by X because of Y. You don't have that ability. And the same thing with, um, it was a really brilliant paper that Steve and um, I guess Will's on the paper too, and, and Judd have written talking about general law, and then at a certain point they sort of talk about Steve and his view about Erie, and the way to deal with Steve's view uh, with Erie, according to Steve, is just to ridicule Justice Holmes. The only thing that's usable for, I mean, some ridicule joke about Justice Holmes, but the point is <laughs> that you just want to ignore this change in legal culture. Like, just pretend realism never happened. And if realism never happened, then we can go on in our old ways to continue to articulate rights the way they would have circa 1840, 1850, 1860. Okay, so I don't think we can do that. And indeed, I would invoke as authority for that my old boss, now passed away, Justice Scalia in Sosa. So in Sosa, you might know this case, you should memorize this case, it's a great case. But in Sosa, the question is whether the alien tort statute will continue to have life um, in the way that the framers of that statute imagined it would. Because the framers of that statute um, imagined it would track customary international law, a kind of general law. And the question in that case was, as customary international law evolves, does the reach of that statute change? So a statute written in 1789 embedding the philosophy of the birth of this general common law, I mean this um, general law framework, um, should it be interpreted according to the framers' understanding or something different? Now, you might think the originalist Scalia would say, well, well I've got to go back to the framers and ask how would they have thought about customary international law? And however they would have thought about it, I will do the same thing. But no, he laughed at that idea. He is as realist and Brandeisian as anybody. And he says, we can't do that law anymore. We don't do that law anymore. We give that up. Because we can't. We don't know how to do that. And if we can't do that, we've got to adjust to something else. And what he adjusts to is finding the appropriate democratic authority to answer the questions asked. Find the appropriate democratic authority to answer the questions asked. If you think a little bit about his jurisprudence and separation of powers, that's the same thing he always does there, too. Morrison is a case where he says, you people think that the special prosecutor statute has a policy built into it? It doesn't, it's all politics. And if it's all politics, we need to make sure that there's a politically, democratically responsible actor at the top, the president. Same thing in his, his uh, opinion, and it's a per curiam, but he wrote it in the um, Bauscher, the Sinar case, where he says, you know, in the old days, they used to believe in scientific policy making, as if scientific policy making could give you real answers, truths. We don't believe that stuff anymore. And so what's the consequence of not believing that? Well, we have to relocate the structure into some democratic authority that makes sense inside of a democracy. 25 years ago, I wrote a paper called The Eerie Effect, which is describing this dynamic generally. Every time understandings shift, so we no longer can see things in the same way, what do we have to ask? We have to ask what's the appropriate democratic authority. So let me bring it back to privileges or immunities. The reason this is significant is, I think, uh, I think Nico is right in the characterization of antebellum understandings of privileges or immunities, but he's describing a context where they are engaging in what Judd is describing as general, uh, um, uh, as general law making. So yes, you are determining, that's the word that um, we should use here, that's the word Adrian uses in the classical legal theory context, they're determining these rights, 
but within a general framework that they have learned and developed that we no longer have access to. So then what does that mean as you carry that forward? You have to take account of the fact we're, we don't have access to that anymore and answer the question, who should be determining those rights? And there are three possible answers. One answer is nobody. We should try to just treat the rights as they were understood to be in 1868 and that's it, we're finished. Like whatever you can find evidence for those rights being, okay, those are the rights, but beyond that there's nothing more. History stops. And it only stops because we lost the ability to do general lawmaking. That's, that's position one. Position two would be the courts. Courts can figure out what those rights are. You know, like the Ouija board theory of constitutional law. They try to say, is this a privilege or yes, this is a privilege. Is this? No, this is not. And it's just the Ouija board is like telling them, right? And the third conception is Congress. Congress gets to step in and say, yes, I now recognize this within the what I will treat as federally enforceable privilege or immunity, in the sense that Jeb is just describing it. It's used, you can use it, use the federal structures to enforce it. But we will make that judgment. Among those three choices, seems to me it should be clear number three is the right answer. There's no reason to say that our understanding of these rights gets frozen, a la Dobbs or Glucksburg, uh, in 1868. Why would that be? And there's no reason to give it to courts. My God, these are the worst democratically accountable entities within our constitutional structure. If anybody is going to have the ability to articulate what these rights are, it should be a democratically accountable institution, and the only one on the field is Congress. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists. It's now about 1.15, so if you have class and you gotta run out, now would be a great time to boogie. But it's Friday, so if everyone leaves, I think that would be very suspicious. <laughs> Okay, um, so I would love to give Professor Campbell uh, a chance to respond to that point from Professor Lessig, but before I do so, I want to ask Professor Lessig a question on terms of translation theory. Um, so you're saying, the upshot of what you're saying is that given that we're in a post-Erie world, you know, we should be leaving this who decides question to Congress. And I think the rebuttal to that would be, well, what about federalism? Because my read of like the 39th congressional debates is that they were still pretty firm believers in some form of federalism. And I think Professor Campbell and Professor Werman's talks get that point across, that they didn't necessarily think that they were entirely upending the entire federalist structure. But if we leave this who decides question to Congress and to give so much discretion to Congress in our realist world. Surely Congress can make a hash of federalism. So how is that a faithful translation to use your phrase, um, even you know, given, given all that you've said about the breakdown of general law? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I, I don't mean to say this is the only principle. So I do think there's a federalism principle that needs to constrain. And, and in my reading of the earlier, earlier cases, um, in particular of, uh, um, slaughterhouse and um, the civil rights cases. I, I do think that we can imagine the court having a kind of boundary authority. Like, okay, this is within the reasonable range of what we could call privileges or immunities, but this is outside it. And it might, that boundary authority might well be motivated by a kind of value of federalism. I mean, the court's been pretty good at making up limits to advance federalist ideals, and so here would be another set of made up limits to advance federalist ideas, and as a translator, I'm all for that, that's great. But um, I don't think we should adopt, we should accept the only other plausible move, the move that Dobbs insists on, that we 
say that the only rights we're going to recognize here are those that somehow tradition has given us. I mean, the reason, the, the, that's both because it's ridiculous to fix rights at a particular point and say there's no more after that, but also because the very methodology is just historically ignorant. Um, I mean, this is partly from Judd's work, but also um, Bill Novak's book, um, uh, um, The People's Welfare, would, would you know, evinces the obvious fact that there is no such thing in our past that was not regulated. Like, there is no space that you have something that was not regulated in some form and some, in some substantive way. So if the only way we get to identify rights, this kind of libertarian core of our constitution is to say, it's been forever the thing that's not been regulated, you just haven't dug deep enough. You just haven't looked in enough archives. And so that's the second reason why I think that methodology must fail. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Professor Campbell, if you have any interest in responding to the, the eerie point, in effect. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll say uh, two things. The first is uh, just to sort of pile on, which is um, it's the condition in which the court engaged in uh, what we would now call sort of living constitutional development of rights uh, and then the uh, originalist reaction to that um, was in the aftermath of the 1950s, during which time, for the first time really in American history, there was complete convergence among the mainstream left and right with respect to the question of who decides. And so judicial supremacy is uh, mostly settled with uh, the exception of some Dixiecrats. And so everybody's approaching questions of constitutional meaning um, in the 70s, 60s and 70s from the standpoint that like, it's the role of the judge to figure out what our rights are. And that really frames the entire discussion about this, both in terms of the Warren Court's adjudication of rights claims and in terms of the conservative reaction, the originalist reaction. Um, which is why you then see people like Justice Scalia saying the meaning of the right is just set in the moment of its uh, uh, enactment in the Constitution. It's a reaction to this problem of judicial role. When you look at the problem historically, you can see that uh, the way in which they're thinking about rights is not framed by a concern about judicial supremacy and the judicial role. It's framed by an underlying conception of what your rights are, where they come from, etc. It has nothing to do with judging. And then a few steps to, into the reasoning, you start asking uh, role morality questions. Uh, and so that just means that we, if we're doing this uh, analysis in a genuinely historical way, should be willing to um, uh, consider the possibility that what we're going to find just like doesn't map onto our conceptual categories. Um, in terms of uh, what we actually do with it, I mean, I do think that there are a broad range of options because there's so many different um, values that are at stake. And so one move might be to say, uh, not just with respect to substantive due process, but other types of rights, uh, including enumerated rights, we should be looking to something that's approximating a developing tradition, but one in which judges aren't at the vanguard. And that would look something like the Glucksburg approach as conceptualized in cases like Glucksburg, as opposed to uh, the reframing of it, um, at least this is my reading of Dobbs, uh, as a sort of the rights are fixed in amber. That is to say that the rights might develop over time, but it's not the judge's responsibility to take the role in shaping them, rather the judge is playing a uh, quasi-law finding role by looking at what the nation's traditions uh, of regulability of certain forms of um, human conduct are. Uh, and so that's one possibility. Another possibility um, uh, that we're just acknowledging is that some of the role in determining these rights should be um, not just made by Congress, but also by state legislatures. And um, I think that's a difficult question. One of the things that uh, you find if you look at the 1800s, uh, 1860s, and 70s debates, is that there's a really strong inter-party split among the Republicans about the nature of the union and the extent to which uh, there is a freestanding national social compact. 
And so a role that gave Congress primary authority to determine the meaning of a bunch of rights would be very faithful to one vision uh, among especially the radical Republicans of what Congress's role is. And I think much less faithful to the vision of some of the moderates, uh, including John Bingham. And so uh, it's a really hard question to answer from an originalist standpoint because you need some account of what um, uh, faction of the Republican Party uh, is relevant. And uh, this is a situation where there's not like a single answer to that. Thanks. I just want to say that I disagree with everybody. Uh, no, but, but just a little bit. So actually, there are lots of commonalities. So let me say two things. One is to pile on the general law point, and then to disagree a bit with uh, Professor Lessig about the uh, Congress's role here. Uh, on the, the general law point, I mean, I actually kind of disagree with both because I agree that there's this thing called general law and that we can do general law, even today. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't oppose that idea. What I do oppose is this, like, this move that professors Bode, Sachs, and Campbell make in their paper, which is to say there is a body of general law that cannot be altered or modified by any competent legislative authority, neither the state legislative authority nor the federal legislative authority, right? Let me read to you just this passage from their paper, quoting the taxi cab case, where Justice Holmes famously said that there is no such body of law, no transcendental body of law outside of any particular state but obligatory within it, unless and until changed by statute. What, so that's end quote. What Judd, Will, and Steves are saying, not only is there this transcendental body of law, the point that I think I agree with, but that Professor Lessig disagrees with, but they're saying there's a body of transcendental law that cannot be changed by statute, neither by state nor, fe nor federal authorities. And that I disagree with, with Judd, Will, and Steve about. So when we, they presented this paper at a conference last week, it's uh, getting a lot of, to see Judd a lot. I asked Steve, can you give me another example of a body of general law that is not uh, abrogatable, I guess, or cannot be abrogated by the state legislature or Congress? And he came up with only one, state borders. State borders, which kind of takes me to a related point, which is why state borders? Well, because general law, I had always understood, and maybe, maybe Judd will disagree with me here, is general because it involves more than one jurisdiction. And if it involves more than one jurisdiction, who says what is the right answer? Okay, so general law, the law of nations, was understood to be general law. The law of merchant, what happens when you have sailors on the high seas, right? What jurisdiction governs? Borders, interstate border disputes, and diversity cases, which is why this is Swift v. Tyson and Erie, they're diversity cases. What do you do when you have people from multiple jurisdictions involved in a legal dispute, so they would apply general law. But that general law typically, and so to the extent it, you, know, you can't abrogate it, I suppose it's because it involves more than one jurisdiction and like state borders, neither one is competent you know, to abrogate it. Of course, the Constitution could have been power, Congress of power, it didn't, that's why it's not. But the point is, this is seriously radical. I mean, usually I'm a radical one. But what Will Stephen and Judd are saying is that there is now a body of general law applicable entirely within a single jurisdiction that that jurisdiction can change. And I just think that's, that, I mean, it, it's a more radical move than they let on. In the so, so I don't think it's radical at all in the following sense. Um, if you understand general law making, as I'm describing it, to be working through a, a process of reasoning to certain conclusions, um, you know, think of it like a formula. Like you do the numbers and you come to a certain kind of conclusion. Um, to say that nobody can change that is just to say that nobody can change the logical implication of that set of reasoning. Like that set of reasoning is there. And then the question is, to, to what extent will that set of reasoning be operable within a jurisdiction? And to the extent a state embraces it, then it's operable. If a state deviates from it, it's the state law that's operable. That still exists out there in the transcendental sense. Um, but it doesn't matter in the, on the ground because the thing that matters on the ground is this legislature. So to the extent I imagine people are capable of engaging in that kind of reasoning, I believe there's a transcendental body of law. Just like you know, there are people who could who can tell me what the 444th digit of pi is. They can just sit there and think through it, right? And um, that's amazing. Like, they don't need the list. They can just work it out. 
there's a website that can do it too. That's what I use. But you know, there's still <laughs> a capacity to do that. And and there are states that have like passed laws that have said actually pi is 3.1428. Period. That's it. Okay. Now that doesn't change pi. Um, you know, pi is still whatever complicated number pi is. But the state pretends it can make 3.1428 operable within that state. And that doesn't seem to be a radical thing to say, yes, the state can't change pi, but the state can make 3.1428 the relevant number that will be used as pi within that state, does it? No, I think I, think I agree with that point. I'm not sure just as a state could make pi 3.1428. Well, it could make Massachusetts or Mississippi pi, three, it's actually, I think, Oklahoma. Oklahoma pi 3.1428. That's not a bridge of pi. I don't know. I think his, his what about Massachusetts pi? So, um, the way we tend to think about common law is that it's judge-made state law. Uh, there's an awareness by professors and um, some students that there is an idea of general law that's not quite state law and it's also not quite judge-made, but we tend to think about that even when we're aware of that older concept. Uh, the idea of general law here that I'm talking about is the idea um, that existed prior to Erie and the Swift versus Tyson case as being defeasible. That is, that it's something that can be displaced by legislative judgment. And I think that's the right way of thinking about most questions of general law. That's an idea of uh, law that, in the older sense, would have just been called common law. That is to say, the word common means general, and it's therefore distinguishable from local law. Uh, but there's also a way of thinking about some aspects of the common law uh, that are fundamental. That is that there is, in uh, the 1770s, a conception uh, that Britain and therefore the colonies have a constitution. It's not written down. It's not like you get your fundamental rights from uh, some enactment, but certain aspects of the constitution, uh, certain aspects of the common law are not ones that the legislature can displace. And so this would be things like uh, habeas, the right against um, prior restraints, the right to confront witnesses, et cetera. These are things that are recognized to be fundamental within the common law and therefore are not subject to legislative modification or displacement. They might still be regulable in certain respects, that is, they might be underdeterminate in some way, so the number of jurors might be something that states can set, even though the right to trial by jury uh, is um, uh, firmly established such that the state can't take it away. But that's the sort of right that I'm talking about. So I'm hoping that we'll get some student questions about general law. Um, but Professor Worman, I wanted to ask, and this is a question of, born of ignorance, um, about the equality reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And my understanding is that such an equality reading could mean an anti-interstate discrimination read or an anti-intrastate. So I know Professor Christopher Green, my understanding is that he thinks that it covers both can you explain your view when you say, maybe I'm just missing, but equality? No, that, that, that's fair. So the reason Philip Hamburger has this paper, right? There was this question where, where he argues that the Privileges or Immunities Clause basically enforces the Comedy Clause. Basically, it makes effective this interstate non-discrimination reading. But then the weird question is, well, why, why is that true if we already have the Comedy Clause? The issue was that free black citizens of northern states were not given Article IV comedy rights when traveling to other states, right? South Carolina imprisoned them if they came into their state. Missouri tried to exclude them. And what was the argument that they made? Not that, oh, they have the same rights as black persons do in our state. They didn't make that argument. They said they're not citizens of the United States within the meaning of the Constitution. And therefore, they're not citizens for purposes of Article IV. If they were citizens of the United States, they would be entitled to the rights of citizens in the South. And if you look at Dred Scott, one argument Tani made you know, for saying, oh, black persons can't be citizens. Because if they were, they'd have the right to carry guns like everyone else does. They'd have the right you know, to travel without a pass like white people can, right? So what solves this problem, this interstate equality, this interstate discrimination against free black citizens of other states? The citizenship clause does. That's what resolves it. It declares them to be citizens of the United States. And therefore, all the arguments that South Carolina made when they made that statement on Samuel Poor's mission coming south, 
you know, the Missouri controversy excluding free blacks, it's resolved. It's resolved. Because the argument that they are according to extent to them was because they weren't citizens of the United States within the meaning of the term citizen in Article 4. But that wasn't the only issue that was raised under Article 4 in the antebellum period. Because blacks would come to the South Carolina, South Carolina would have, I mean, southern states would have rules like if you're um, a black person, you have to show that you have permission to be traveling. And so a New, York, a, a New York black person in South Carolina is subject to the same rule as a black person in South Carolina. But they would assert, I shouldn't be subject to this rule because I'm an American citizen. So it's not just that they didn't get the rights that anybody would have. It was that they were burdened by the particular burdens of being a black person in South Carolina. You know, no, that, that's exactly right. And that goes to the question of whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause or Article 4 under the ellipses reading that the anti-slavery Republicans had, which was that it secured the citizens of each state being ipso facto citizens of the United States shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States in the several states. This is the John Bingham reading, the Jacob Howard reading, the anti-slavery reading that became the Privileges or Immunities Clause. The question is, does that mean that South Carolina can't require a pass to travel for white citizens as well as black citizens? Or merely that if it doesn't require such passes of white citizens, it can't require them of black citizens? That's the question that I think the equality reading answers. It says if states want to prohibit handguns, I think they could do it. What they can't say is only white persons can have guns, only, only white citizens can have guns. And that, that's the claim that I'm trying to make in, by, by the equality reading. OK, and so if we accept that claim, how, how do we understand the scope of equality? So in, in 17, 1870, it's, it's about race. Is it about sex today, or sexual orientation? Or? Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to filibuster. <laughs> this is the trillion dollar question, right? What is the distinction between a regulation of the content of a right, which we know is allowed, and an abridgment of that right? And I talk a little bit about it in the book, but not as much as I should. Uh, but the Privileges or Immunities Clause is not limited to race, right? So the question, what is an abridgment? We know the black codes are an abridgment, even though, because everyone thought that they were the quintessential example, but it's not limited to that, right? So what makes an abridgment an abridgment? So I'm gonna propose an answer, which is gonna sound maybe like I'm a bit of a constitutionalist, okay? Some conservative reviewers are, have accused me of that, okay? The question is, but John Harrison agrees with me, which usually means that it's right. The question is, is it reason, is this purported regulation reasonably related to the purpose of the right? If it is, then it's a regulation. If it's not, an abridgment. So why are the black codes obviously an abridgment? Because everyone except, you know, even, even Tani in Dred Scott, right, ex accepted that if you're citizens, skin color has nothing to do with why we have contract rights. Think about it. what's the purpose of contract rights? What's the purpose of property rights? Skin color has nothing to do with that has nothing to do with those rights. It's not reasonably related to the purpose of those rights or the content of those rights, okay? This is why a gay code that said gays can enter into contracts, gays can own property, would be equally unconstitutional. And I don't have to decide that being gay is a suspect class. Who cares? Being gay has nothing to do with contract or property rights, okay? Now, should marriage be limited to a man and a woman? Is that a regulation of the contract of the right of marriage? Or is that an abridgment because it's not reasonably related to the purposes of the right of marriage? And that's where all the fighting was, by the way, in the Obergefell case, right? And in my book, I make it, you know, what are these purposes of marriage? You know, welfare institution, healthcare institution, you know, um, uh, love, partnership, dignity, and so on. Gays can participate equally in that. The hardest question is procreation and child rearing, which they can participate even in that, mostly equally. You know, sprinkle in no-fault divorce for straight people, and you downplay that and the importance of that. It starts to look like an abridgment. At least it is a plausible case for Obergefell that I, I think it wouldn't meet the clearly erroneous uh, test for precedent that Justice Thomas has announced. So that, that's the question that has to be asked. Is it going to always be obvious what the abridgment is? Or is it reasonably related to the purpose of the right? Is there going to have to be some deference to legislative judgments, state legislative judgments about that? I think so. Um, but it's a question that I think it requires us to ask. But maybe I'm wrong about everything. Um, so let's turn to some, we have a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> Richard? Professor, uh, Leslie, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our major. Professor Leslie, I wanted to uh, focus and get on your remarks. So you rely heavily on the fact that you can't discover the general law that you used to. But I was wondering whether you even need to rely on that to still make your 
point because I know you have a lot of originalist evidence that when the 14th Amendment was passed, what the framers were doing was actually assigning to Congress the responsibility to define the provisions of the of citizenship. We've got this statement by John Bingham that the primary purpose of the amendment was to arm the Congress of the United States with powers to enforce civil rights. And Charles Phelps, an opponent of the amendment, said that if it was passed, it would be for Congress to define and determine by law in what the privileges and immunities of citizens consist. This is evidence from the Professor who we know that uh, Coley's on it. So whether or not, it sounds like we can, whether or not the project of judges discovering the general law is feasible, it sounds like that might be irrelevant because the legal effect of the 14th Amendment was to assign the responsibility to Congress to determine what they would be. Can you expound on this? Or yeah, so, so I'm happy to accept that framing, but I don't think it changes the point. Because if you're living at a time where what you imagine determining privileges or immunities to be is the conclusion of a process of reasoning, the scope of the degrees of freedom under that activity are relatively narrow. Like, you know, whatever you're going to do, you're not going to come up with, I don't know, some, some, pick some kind of crazy right that would have nothing to do with the structure of reasoning of fundamental rights or um, um, or general rights that would be the process of general law. So in that context, you're saying, okay, our determiner is gonna be Congress. Of course, um, the extreme opposite would be say, our determiner is the courts. People read Slaughterhouse to be saying, the determiner is the courts and there are none. Um, I don't think that's the fair reading of Slaughterhouse, but the point is you can see either all or none or someplace in between, right? Um, but if you give up the ability to do that determining, if you don't have any more a structure of reasoning that is common and understood and we can debate it and like work it through, and you just simply say, and it's for Congress, then you get back to Tom's point. Well, if it's just for Congress to say whatever they want, then yes, we can totally destroy federalism. We can do whatever, you know, we can create all sorts of weird rights out there. Um, and so I, I I, I, I think we might have to be there from the standpoint of like who's the appropriate democratic institution if we do not accept the, we're gonna fix ourselves in the Dobbs way, I like the idea in amber, um, to the rights that existed back there. Yes, if that's not gonna be our answer, it's gotta be something like Congress. Um, but I wouldn't oppose the idea, as I said in response to Tom, of some kind of governor in the sense of an, a mo an engine's governor, a governor on top of that, like the court, that sort of says this is kind of beyond it. So like, you know, civil rights cases, in my view, is the court saying it's consistent with the idea that Congress gets to say what are privileges or immunities, but this goes too far because these are social rights. We're not going to allow you to recognize these as within the scope of the privileges or immunities because these are not the sort of things that would fit within that structure of reason. Uh, Owen? Yeah, so under the work of people like Chris Green, most originals nowadays agree that the protection clause has very little to do with anti discrimination and most to do with physical security protection. But in the, for instance, SFA oral arguments, everyone was talking about equal protection as if it was about anti discrimination. For each of you, what is your understanding of the clause in the Fourth Amendment to do with the issue of race based protective action? Is it okay? Is it not? First, can I jump in on the previous question and then I will dodge your question, but I'll explain why. Um, so what you say, I think I'll resort to back, back to what Judd said, which is the historical record has a range of possibilities here. And the question is, do you value the radical Republicans who wanted Congress to basically be able to define anything or the more moderate fashion? And Judd is a historian, right? And he's like, look, these are all possible. But for those of us in the real world, like you guys are going to have to be lawyers and decide, okay, what's the operation to operationalize this? You have to kind of make a judgment about this, usually, maybe, maybe not. And what do you do with the original draft of the 14th Amendment, which would have been an affirmative grant of power to Congress to make all laws necessary and proper to secure to the persons in the several states equal protection in life, liberty, and property? There were federalist concerns with this, and especially Hale, Hotchkiss, and Stewart. But let me just focus on Hotchkiss. He said the draft. Uh, proposed by its terms to authorize Congress to establish uniform laws throughout the United States upon the subject name, the protection of life, liberty, and property. 
and Hotchkiss was unwilling that Congress should have such power because I do not want rebel law when rebels control Congress in the future, which they did in the 1870s. I do not want rebel laws to govern and be uniform throughout this union. And Hale, Hotchkiss, what they said was persuasive. They, amend, they, they tabled the amendment. It was never to be seen again, that draft. And until it was put you know, in a self-executing way uh, with, the, with the final draft, this assuaged the federalism objections. Uh, and so you have to contend with, with that, that. The majority of the House appeared to agree with that concern. It's not possible to know why they tabled it, right? but they appeared to agree with that federalism concern. And if you're right about Congress gets to decide what the religious immunities are, right? All 50 states shall, shall uh, allow bakers to work more than 10 hours in a day, as many hours as they want, because that is the fundamental privileges and immunities of bakers. That sounds like uniform contract law that the United States, right? So what do we do with it? That's not to say the enforcement power doesn't do anything. It does. It allows them to create causes of action. You know, is the, is the Fourth Amendment, does it create a cause of action without Congress? Right? It allows federal prosecutors to bring actions instead of just relying on plaintiffs you know, who are transgressed against it. It does work. It does real work, but maybe not that one. Yeah. So the, the distinction that the proponents of the amendment are making is between Congress identifying abridgments and Congress having primary authority to regulate in the first place. And they think that they have the former, but not the latter. As for affirmative action, I, I was on a panel recently, the National Constitution Center does a podcast about this, where I basically dodged the question. I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard. I was asked to write a brief in this case, and I was like, no, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is. I think affirmative action, depending on the program, is much more plausible under my reading, because is it reasonably related? So assuming public privileges are covered, which I think they are, that's another paper. Uh, you know, so assuming they're covered, is affirmative action programs reasonably related to the purpose of higher education? What are those purposes? Might diversity be one? I mean, that becomes harder. Now, it's a hard question because if through doing that, you in fact upbridge the privileges and immunities of others, you know, because you can statistically show that Asian Americans, you know, have to outperform in order to get the same, that's what makes it hard. That's what makes it really, really hard. And so that's an answer, not a dodge, I suppose. Not a satisfactory answer, maybe. Yeah, so I, I mean, I would say maybe, but there's some gymnastics to get there. So uh, the two routes that you would go would be to say, on well, my, my view of the, what the Privileges or Immunities Clause is doing, is either that um, by taxing and taking away people's property, there's some then subsequent obligation on the state to provide for the neutral uh, use of those taxes. And you do see some people making those uh, arguments. The provision of public employment or uh, access to public resources itself is not going to be within the scope of privileges or immunities on, on my view. Uh, and then the other way that you get there, which I'm open to, but uh, in, is in no way entailed in um, what I said today, is that there's also a requirement of equality with respect to state citizenship rights that the 14th Amendment recognizes. That, in my view, is not part of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but it, it's at least a plausible reading of other parts of the 14th Amendment. And so uh, I would just want to say the things I've said today are not to say that's uh, not another way of potentially limiting state power. You know, I think the, the actual answer here is so far removed from, from the question of what was decided in 1870. Um, because the actual answer is being driven by the courts. It's a fidelity to role problem. The actual answer is being driven by the courts' discomfort with appearing inconsistent in its application of this strict scrutiny standard. And Thomas has been the most vocal to demonstrate the inconsistency. Like you say, this is compelling state interest. Um, how could it possibly be a compelling state interest to be discriminating on the basis of race for the purpose of increasing the comfort or the diversity of, you know? So this is not a, sub, it's not substantively related to the issue. It's more, how can we have a doctrine that uh, doesn't appear silly and inconsistent? Um, and, and so I don't know the gymnastics they're gonna go through to try to resolve that. Um, um, and, but I don't think it has to do with you know, what was debated in 1868. All right, I think maybe we'll wrap up with one more. Sam? So it's my pleasure to ask a question of Pets on Congress. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I, I would normally direct this question to Professor Sachs, he's not here, 
Brown said. Um, so thinking about general law in the 14th Amendment, Professor Sachs has argued that a different part of the 14th Amendment that general law supplies substantive rules, and that's personal jurisdiction. So on, on Professor Sachs' read, Neuer against Neff says that the rules of personal jurisdiction come from the general law, and the 14th Amendment due process clause supplies federal question review or federal jurisdiction uh, or a constitutional defense to absorbing jurisdiction. Okay. And Professor Sachs suggests, well, those general rules might change over time. They come from the general law and not from the 14th Amendment itself. So for privileges or immunities, if those rules come from the general law, are those going to change over time from the general law, or are they you know, fixed or closed at the time of ratification? I'm curious how your theory answers that, if it's you know, parallel with the personal jurisdiction case, or so. Yeah, so to the extent that we're thinking about what the general law is in terms of the customs that operate across the jurisdictions, uh, that could change. It's also possible to think about the general law in a slightly different way, which is as the sort of output of a process of reasoning that itself remains constant, but our awareness of what it tells us changes over time. And so it's possible, or, or uh, as Larry says, the circumstances might change. So it's possible that something that would have been widely recognized as consistent with general fundamental rights in 1868, let's say the law of coverture, uh, would, after a whole bunch of intervening changes in our awareness about the nature of women, for instance, and also uh, just a customary change in what women's role in society is, uh, radically shifts such that for a state to recognize the law of coverture today would just be an obvious violation of basic precepts of general law, whether understood in a sort of customary law sense or in a kind of rule of reason sense. So I think um, on either of those views, you can recognize change across time. But just to pile on, right? So yes, that's exactly right. But that's why I'm anxious to identify who is the, what is the institution that gets to articulate those changes. And if you share skepticism about courts, which we should, like conservatives have from the very beginning been skeptical about courts, um, then the question is who, who if not courts? Um, and if it's not Congress, if it's not an unconstrained Congress, then a constrained Congress, because it's gotta be something other than um, um, it's nothing or it's courts. I think we'll wrap up with that. Um, thank you so much to our three panelists. I'm so grateful.